Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 143, December 11th to December 17th, 1863. Last week, we talked about Lincoln's 10% plan, a kind of early look into what Reconstruction would look like. We talked about the Knights of the Golden Circle, and also John Hunt Morgan's escape from federal prison. This week, we need to talk about what's been going on in Louisiana and Texas, as it has been some time since we checked that region out. We will spend some time in southwest Virginia to talk about another successful William Wing Averill raid. Before we do that, though, we need to wrap up Knoxville and this stage of Longstreet's East Tennessee operations. Of course, we do have Patreon content, and uh, since we are here in December, we did a movie review that was Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, so it's a little bit of a different direction than a lot of these movie reviews have been in. A lot of more serious, I guess we could say, movies, and this one was a little bit uh, of a off-the-beaten-path, kind of a a little lighter-hearted, I suppose, movie review. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, we have other movie reviews memoir reviews, and also picture slideshows of modern-day battlefields. So if any of that sounds interesting, we do have a link to the Patreon in the show description. And of course, those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. When we left off at Knoxville, the Confederate attack at Fort Sanders had been repulsed on November 29th. Longstreet, true to his nature during the campaign, would be indecisive in what to do in the days before withdrawing. For a brief amount of time, Longstreet would consider to continue the siege. Supplies, though, would be an issue, as they were poor on both sides. Many Confederate and Union boys without shoes or proper winter clothing. In addition, Grant had dispatched Sherman to relieve Burnside, As we have mentioned before, Washington especially wanting him to make sure the Department of the Ohio was taken care of. Sherman has been busy. If you remember originally, he had been in charge of the pursuit of Bragg's army. Once Claiborne had his delaying action at Ringgold, however, Sherman would be recalled, the real connection between the two severed. Now this is probably because Grant does not trust anyone else, but Sherman and his hodgepodge of a command would start to move on Longstreet. He had not only two divisions of his own corps, but also Howard's 11th, Jeff Davis's division, and Granger's 4th Corps heading out from Chattanooga. Orlando Wilcox would also be nipping at Longstreet from his position, although he only has 6,000 in his command. In total, Sherman would have 30,000 men, meaning the writing was on the wall for the Confederates. Longstreet would begin his withdrawal deeper into East Tennessee, placing himself in a position where he could move into southwest Virginia. Maybe not wishing to relinquish his independent status, he would opt to continue operating in the region, despite being advised moving through southwest Virginia to get back to Lee was his best bet. With the state of the Confederacy the way it was, having Longstreet maybe remain in East Tennessee in winter there would not be entirely a terrible idea, although we talked about how East Tennessee is a little bereft of the proper capabilities to support an army logistically, so it's not necessarily the best spot, but then again, he's not going to be in Northern Virginia, Central Virginia, where there is going to be a big drain on supplies. We mentioned how Back in earlier 1863, Longstreet goes into North Carolina to kind of gather in supplies, and they couldn't have the entire army together just because the logistical network is not going to support that. At least where they are right now, there is a rail link into southwest Virginia, so even though there's not a whole lot of railroads, there is at least some kind of area in which that Longstreet could gather supplies if he remains in East Tennessee It's also going to be an issue for Grant, for the Union, if he remains there, right? They can't just go without having at least some kind of check toward a Confederate force in this region. 
Longstreet's troops would start moving away on December 2nd. December 3rd would see Sherman starting to arrive. Knoxville had been placed under siege for 18 days, but now it was liberated. Now we have these supposed rumors that the Union Army in Knoxville was living well, actually made worse by Sherman himself, who was treated to a nice dinner by Burnside. We know that the supply situation was a little more dire than some of Sherman's men would lead us to believe. Mission accomplished, Kump would then decide to move back to Chattanooga, him having no love of East Tennessee. Granger would remain behind to stabilize Burnside. Sherman also reasoned that Burnside outranked him, which, keep in mind, for future problems. Granger would complain immediately at being left behind, earning him the ire of Grant. Remember, too, that Gordon Granger had been on Grant's list, as it were, as during the assaults on the Missionary Ridge portion of the battles around Chattanooga, he was sighting cannons instead of maybe acting like a corps commander probably would, right? So he is definitely dinging himself a hole here. At this time, there was some shifting of personnel. Burnside was replaced by John Foster. Jacob Cox was arriving to take over for Malin Manson, and Samuel Sturgis was taking over for Shackelford. So, we have a whole bunch of familiar names, as we have covered these folks in previous episodes. Park had led the pursuit of Longstreet, advancing as far as Bean Station, a little north and east of the city. Longstreet will continue to operate in the area, given command of all the rebel forces in this region. Obviously, this would appeal to Longstreet, given a reprieve from rejoining Lee, but it did not mean there was going to be any less of a supply issue. Bean Station would be manned by cavalry, though, under the command of Shackelford, before he was relieved of his command. This would be a good opportunity for some offensive action that might turn the tide in East Tennessee. The area around Beans was manned by cavalry units under Wolford and John Foster. These units had been involved in the successful delaying action conducted by Sanders, and some of them were armed with Spencer repeating rifles. Longstreet would deploy William Martin's cavalry, while also converging infantry toward the outpost, which was due to be set up with earthworks. As it was, part of the command occupied a hotel in a defensive position. Archibald Gracie's Alabama regiments and Fulton's Tennessee regiments of Bushrod Johnson's command would launch an attack on the cavalry, engaging skirmishers, but facing a steady fire from the hotel. Gracie himself would actually be hit in the arm during the engagement. Shells from friendly Union artillery would make things complicated for the defenders. Eventually, Kershaw would be called in to turn the left flank of the Federal line. Johnson was pressed by Longstreet to turn the right, but was not given too much in terms of support. The Union troopers would need to be dislodged from their makeshift stronghold at the hotel. These were men from the 24th Kentucky Mounted Infantry. Artillery and infantry approaching would make the position untenable, the cavalry eventually forced to withdraw. 290 Confederates had been lost as compared to 115 Union troopers. The Confederate cavalry would fail to cut off their counterparts, although on December 15th, they would flank their enemy out of a new position. By this time, the Union infantry had come up, meaning that Longstreet would have to call off his planned attempt to eliminate the advance elements of Park's command. We will pick up at the conclusion of Longstreet's adventure in a future episode, amazingly, as it's not over yet. So we will now shift our attention once again to William Averill launching a cavalry raid into Virginia proper. Now this would have actually a direct effect on Longstreet's decision to stay in East Tennessee. You see, as we mentioned before, staying where he was was not necessarily a terrible idea, drawing Union forces into unforgiving terrain that could benefit his smaller numbers. However, this would all depend on whether he was properly supplied. Averill was given the okay from Benjamin Kelly to put that very wrench into Old Pete's plan. <laughs> 
If you remember Droop Mountain and White Sulphur Springs, Averill had been trying to get at the weak Confederate Railroad presence in southwest Virginia for some time, but so far he had been turned away without ultimate success to his missions. In the frigid December weather and conditions, he would try again. It was still in early December where he was resting his tired 4th separate brigade, but would hatch a plan with Kelly, where four different columns would seize points to support Averill, who still had his 2nd, 3rd, and 8th West Virginia Mounted Infantry, as well as the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry. These men would advance out in December, linking up and resupplying with infantry on December 11th. The next day, they would set out again, this time the separate brigade veering off to their true destination, which would be further south on the rail line near Roanoke, Salem, or Botetourt County. Any of these locations would be sufficient for their objective. Supplies and equipment would be destroyed, as well as the rail line torn up, with ties heated and bent. We have briefly talked about how you heat up a railroad tie and then you bend it around a tree. they are come to be referred to as Sherman's neck ties uh, later in the war, especially after the march to the sea. But that's what they're doing when they're trying to disable a railroad line. A major part of the plan would be to threaten Stanton, which would be done using the attached infantry. If you remember, this was an effective feint in some of the previous raids. At least this early in the raid, it would work, with John Eccles, who we talked about in our previous Averill adventures, being forced to retire from his position. This was also in part the converging columns, which made it so the rebels would have to react to multiple threats. Averill, meanwhile, was moving his forces not on main roads, which would prove difficult once again in the terrain. Confederate partisans would skirmish with the various Union troops, always a hindrance in this theater of the war. Because of this, one of the supporting columns under Scammon would retire, as would another in fear of being cut off by the guerrillas. This was not part of the plan, as it would give Eccles and his superior, Samuel Jones, the ability to focus on the 4th separate brigade. Jones would wire Richmond that he needed reinforcements to stop the Federals, Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry eventually being dispatched by rail from Charlottesville. Averill would realize his old adversary, Mudwall Jackson, was also giving chase, which would make the speed of the operation that much more imperative. And by December 15th, he was within striking distance of Salem, and so would push his men hard to get there, still with the element of surprise. The Confederates would have inadequate numbers of troops stationed close by to stop him. If you remember, there was a talk a while back about having a shell defense in the south. Once you broke through the outer part, you could do real damage with lightning movements, as Benjamin Grierson displayed for us earlier this year. On December 16th, Avril would push into Salem. It was good that he had moved in very quickly, because there had been at least some troops scheduled to arrive by train from Lynchburg. But artillery fire dissuaded the engineer from continuing, which allowed for Avril and his men to wreak a little havoc. In his report, Averill would claim the destruction of 2,000 barrels of flour, 10,000 bushels of wheat, 100,000 bushels of shelled corn, 50,000 bushels of oats, 2,000 barrels of meat, several cords of leather, 1,000 sacks of salt, and also clothing. Now, these might have been exaggerated claims, but what we can assume is that Averill was tearing up some supplies that Longstreet was going to need in his neck of the woods. The damage would be repaired, though, so in that regard, the line was not cut so severely. Averill now led his separate brigade away from Salem, aware that now the Confederates were closing in on him. He decided that he would try a direct path to safety, which would bring him closer to the enemy. Perhaps, since by this point his men were subjected to freezing rain, a direct route seemed to be preferable. Fortunately, Mudwall Jackson would live up to his name and be beaten to a key bridge, allowing for the majority of the raiders to escape to safety. The 14th Pennsylvania was briefly cut off, the bridge being burned by their comrades, but the regiment would escape by crossing the river anyway, after not being pressed by the rebels. 
By December 26, the command was in Beverly, wary and in desperate need of resupply. The raid had been 400 miles in terrible winter conditions, which would disable a lot of Avril's command, who did not make it back. Most of the casualties were uncaptured, almost 100 federal troopers being eventually sent to Andersonville, where many would die. It is interesting to argue the exact importance of the raid, because once again the damage was repaired, and perhaps the actual figures were exaggerated. If anything, it might inspire more quick-mounted action on the part of Union troopers. Denying Longstreet any kind of supply in already supply bereft East Tennessee was going to be a problem, especially if the figures were anywhere close to correct. We will return to East Tennessee soon enough in a theater and actions of the war I really do not know too much about. I also do not know a lot about William Averill, so it has been interesting to see him on his path to redemption since the Chancellorsville campaign. To close out today, it's about time we did a little backtracking to figure out what's going on in Texas. When we were last in Louisiana, we talked about how Nathaniel Banks had a grand plan to hold the rebels in check in the Pelican State, while he would lead an invasion of the Lone Star State. In early November, he would land without much incident on Padre Island, which I bet isn't too bad this time of year. Confederates under Hamilton B., who guarded the Rio Grande region, would be forced to retreat, taking as much supply out of Brownsville as they could. Many of the recruits would desert or turn to looting, being made up of the Tejano population, which was not necessarily supportive of the Confederacy. Banks would request for more troops and for support from New Mexico in order to wrangle the state, but at least for the moment, the flag flew once again in Texas. French holdings and pro-French forces were likewise removed from Matamoros, a key town on the border, which meant no help in terms of supply for the South. Remember that the north of Mexico is going to be a stronghold for pro-Republican forces, as well as a stomping ground for warlords. Now the U.S. government is going to have an outlet to help in the war effort against Maximilian. In addition, this was a big political victory provided by banks to use as leverage in future dealings. Banks soon, though, would return to New Orleans, him leaving the landward invasion to Napoleon Dana and the coastal operations to Cadwaller Washburn. The amount of troops being funneled into Texas was going to be a problem for Franklin's command, still in the vicinity of Vermilionville, being watched by the Confederates who had poured in resources to face him there. With skirmishing going on, Franklin would grow weary, and there was always that pesky Tom Green out there with his Texas cavalry trying to harass him. Pulling back seemed prudent, but at the same time, Walker's Texas division would prey on some Union shipping. This was not so good for the Lincoln administration, who had thought with the capture of Vicksburg, there would be no issues with river traffic. Nathaniel Banks would see his once promising plan start to unravel. Union troops were succumbing to disease, and frankly, he had overstretched in dividing up his forces. He had seemingly fewer numbers than were necessary in either of his ventures. In addition, the passing of the 10% plan would hamper the Union operations in the region, as many in Louisiana saw this as another wildly inappropriate piece of government intervention, which you know was part of the argument in the first place, right? While Banks was chastised by the Lincoln administration in December of 1863, at least he would have some action occurring in the Lone Star State. Now this is something that we're not going to get into until 1864 or 2024 here, but there is a concept that we've talked about before, and that's the concept of interior lines and the ability for you to support and supply your army or armies by using them. And here we have a big plan by Nathaniel Banks, and maybe he thinks he's going to get more troops than he will, and it's possible maybe there could have been some that were sent his way, but obviously the focus was shifted once Chickamauga and Chattanooga happens. We need to make sure that Burnside is okay in East Tennessee. So there's all these factors that are going against him not being reinforced with any more men, 
and the capture of an entire state of Texas, regardless of how strong the Confederate forces there are, is going to be difficult with the amount of men that he has, and especially if half of those men are still in Louisiana. And Louisiana, as we have kind of highlighted here, is a tough nut to crack for Banks and the Union armies there. There's a lot of bushwhacking, guerrilla fighting there, and there is a stubborn defense that is being put on by Richard Taylor, and Kirby Smith is doing at least an okay job of putting together the department, especially now that he's cut off from the rest of the Confederacy. So here we see we have Banks kind of grinding to a halt. And one of the things that Ulysses S. Grant is going to come up with, and at least in early 1864, this isn't going to be followed to the letter necessarily, but one of the things that he's going to come up with is that we need to have these campaigns that are going to be in supporting distance of one another. It's kind of one of the problems of the Confederacy on the flip side, right, is that they have a lot of area to cover and they're trying to shift forces between the different theaters and they do an okay job of that. It would have been probably easier if they had more railroads, but they obviously do not. And we've highlighted that as being an issue. However, if Grant is going to win the war, he wants to make sure that he has these armies that are going to be able to support each other. And quite frankly, Texas, South Padre Island, if you look at a map, Brownsville, it's a very, at the very Southern end of of Texas, that's not necessarily going to be a good spot to make it so these interior lines are going to work, right? So reinforcement supply, that's going to be an issue for the Union Army. So that is a concept that we will once again cover as we get into 1864. In Texas, Thomas Ransom would lead an expedition against Corpus Christi. The Vermont native had been wounded at Fort Donelson in Shiloh before performing well at Vicksburg. His operations would result in the successful capture of Fort Sims, defended by only a handful of Texas Rangers. The next target would be the more impressive work at Fort Esperanza. This was better armed and generally a more formidable obstacle. With Ransom moving up the island, he would be joined by additional troops from Henry Dana Washburn. Washburn was born in Vermont, but had moved to Indiana, serving in the 18th Indiana before his elevation in command. After the war, he will go on to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives for his adopted state. Under the overall direction of Cadwalder Washburn, these two divisions would move to continue the conquest of Texas in late November. On November 27th at Fort Esperanza, there would be only 500 or so Texans who would briefly show a resolve to fight. They were mostly armed with solid shot though, so definitely not quite the best tool against an infantry assault. Washburn had decided that after a day of sporadic firing and artillery dueling, he would take the work via an assault with Ransom and Washburn's regiments. Reinforcements would be on the way, some of which was in the form of a new mounted division created by John Bankin Magruder, as well as from our friend from the beginning of last year, Leon Smith. These units would not get there in time, however, the garrison exploding their stores before escaping. The Federals were now in possession of a fort at the mouth of the Bay of Matagorda. From there, they would capture Indianola, banks having to put their operations on pause, although there was much in terms of probing and destruction of cotton and cattle. Magruder had gathered his command, but also sent for Tom Green and his Texas cavalry, which would be a big help for any kind of showdown in Texas. This would not come, however. Despite things may be looking promising around Christmas time, 1863, January of 1864 would see new objectives mainly the Red River Valley. Texas would simply have to wait for the moment, and Banks, unhappily, would be tossed to the side. We have to feel at least a bit for Nathaniel Banks. He was definitely seeking some glory and redemption, and was probably on par with Grant not too long ago. Now Grant would soon take the reins of the Union war effort, whereas he would be kept on a sideshow. He was given not a whole lot of men to accomplish two major tasks, and as the war situation changed at Chickamauga, he would be given no support, which would sort of bring this kind of, well, why are you doing that, attitude on him, which may not exactly be fair. 
We're going to have more campaigns as we get into 1864, so hold on to these thoughts. But I think it is interesting to take a look at this theater of the war, as there is not a whole lot of attention paid in your mainstream sources. So we will go ahead and bring our episode to a close. We had continued action in Longstreet's adventure in East Tennessee at Bean Station. We're going into 1864 with Old Pete loitering in the Volunteer State, so we will return shortly. Averill's Salem raid may have done at least a little bit of damage toward the Confederate plans in this area. Finally, we checked back on what's going on in Texas and Louisiana, something we had started to do a while back. Next week, we will have a little bit of an odds and ends episode, which might be nice since we have done some heavy campaigning. We are going to talk Civil War photography, Loretta Haneta Velasquez, and also maybe dig into some support functions within the Army. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week. Week.